a system which locks people up like animals in cages for 23 hours out of 24 is basically inhumane. Do we have a good system? No, I don't think we do. My terms of reference were to report within a year, which I'm quite sure they realised was impossible. The documentation was so heavy that literally they had to survey the building. It was a period of my life when I was really stressed. Your family worried that you might even be on the verge of a nervous yes. breakdown. No, I think I probably was. This is The Judges, Power, Politics and the People, hosted by the University of Law. This week, I'm speaking with Lord Phillips of Worth Matravers. Nicholas Phillips is one of the most senior judicial figures in the land. He has held all three highest posts in the judicial hierarchy. He was senior law lord, and then became the first president of the newly created UK Supreme Court in 2009, holding the post until 2012. It was the climax of a career which had also seen him serve as master of the roles and as Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. In that position, he oversaw the modernisation of judges' robes, including the abolition of wigs in the civil courts. Lord Phillips went to Bryanston School and after national service to King's College, Cambridge, where he read law. He carved out a successful career as a commercial barrister. He also chaired the inquiry into BSE, or mad cow disease. He sits as a crossbencher in the House of Lords and as a non-permanent UK judge in the Court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong. I began by asking Lord Phillips what his various judicial posts had been like. I've always enjoyed whatever I was doing, with one exception. Um, and looking back on it, um, the work was enjoyable, whatever one was doing was positive, as far as life's yes. enjoyment was concerned. But I don't remember any of the particular roles being more pleasant or exciting than, than, another. than another. Well, that's not quite true. Being Lord Chief Justice at the changeover time was more demanding and exciting than being the first president of the Supreme Court, where your role was really to make sure that the change from the law lords was seamless. Yes. So more of the same. And of course, we'll come back to this, but when you became Lord Chief Justice, it was a different role. The role had changed. The role was changing was at changing that time. Was changing at that time, yes, and yes. you were the first incumbent yes. of the changed role. That's right. And when you say, as you did just a minute ago, with one exception, I think you're referring to the BSE inquiry, the BSE inquiry, which I'd like to come back to yeah, again, sure. if I may, yeah, because yeah. That, that's interesting in itself. Um, anyway, so let's talk about the Lord Chief Justice then. You were the first holder in the post after the uh, 2005 Act, which brought in all the reforms and made it a different job, made it more yes. responsible. How, how was it different? Well, you, you became the head of the judiciary of England and Wales in place of the Lord Chancellor. And so this calls for certain administrative changes in order to get a grip of the whole scenario. And so one of the unusual things I did was to ask Igor Judge to be head of criminal justice. Oh, yes. And, that was uh, a new position. Uh, yes. I mean, almost by definition, being Lord Chief Justice meant you were head of criminal justice. And everyone thought of the role of Lord Chief Justice as being the senior criminal judge in the land. Yes. And the, so the focus was all on crime as it, far as the Lord Chief Justice was concerned. Yes. This now had to be replaced by a much wider uh, administrative duties, as well as being head of the judiciary of England. Le and less of a judge and more of a manager? Or well, is that not there really were addi fair? additional administrative tasks. Yes. And so, um, and Igor Judge, in a way, was a classic Lord Chief Justice with a, a criminal background. And, um, you know, if he'd been appointed Lord Chief Justice at that time, it would have been a perfectly logical appointment. Yes. Um, and it seemed to me that he would be of great assistance and in the right place if he took over being head of criminal justice. So you had him uh, as your right hand, at your right yes. hand, if you like. Um, and you then had to start dealing with ministers and um, fighting for budgets and things like that. How did you find the job? Did you find it stressful? 
I didn't, I've, I've no recollection of being stressed. Challenging. <laughs> and um, it, it gave scope for me to try to put in place various ideas I had about improvements. The only one I succeeded on uh, was changing judicial dress. Yes, you did. But I think a I, lot of people will remember you for that. I think that's probably the only thing that a lot of people <laughs> will remember me for. But I had other ideas which I didn't succeed in getting across. One was to make the civil justice system echo the criminal justice system where you had a single court, but the important cases were presided over by high court judges and the less important by circuit judges. And that seemed to work perfectly well with a single court system. And when you looked at the civil system, the difference between the county court and the high court struck me as, as on the face of it, fairly absurd because most of the high court cases were being tried by county court judges, circuit judges. So why did that not happen, that reform? Well, I couldn't demonstrate to the Lord Chancellor, head of the so justice system, that the there were going to be significant benefits. Savings, I mean, economic benefits, right. probably. Right, yes. It would have involved, you know, quite a lot of uh, change. It would. But there would have been a, a single system. You wouldn't have had yes. a white book for the High Court. And It's true, it would have been a big upheaval. Yes, it would have been big It's interesting. How did you find your dealings with the Lord Chancellors? And was it more than one? Uh, it was largely Lord Faulkner. Yeah. And I got on with him very well. Yes. And I mean, he was a great... I mean, he was behind the changes... He was indeed, yes, so it was in his much. interest to make them work. Yes, and when you read about the debate, when you read the debates in the House of Lords as to what he envisaged the new Supreme Court as being, um, they are discordant to some extent with the way things turned out. Can you remember, just looking back, before we come to robes and wigs, which ah. I would like to do, yeah. can you remember how all this happened? It was, it was a bit of a bombshell, wasn't it? Do you remember well, the, first hearing about it? I remember very well first hearing about it because I persuaded Harry, I was then master of the roles, I persuaded Harry Wolfe, it would be a good idea to have a weekend away with the, the kind of senior members of the Lord Chancellor's department, just discussing justice in general and improvements that could be made. And we, we went to this very nice little country uh, inn, really, but it, yes. it had all the resources you needed for the conference centre. Yes. Uh, Hayden Phillips, permanent secretary, oh, didn't yes. turn up. Oh, he didn't. And it was while we were there that the news broke that the Lord Chancellor was being abolished and <laughs> the members of his department who were there had no idea this was going to happen. And, of course, you, senior oh, judiciary, didn't no, know either. No, we didn't did know you? either. And I remember... Lord Wolf being on the phone to uh, Lord Faulkner and chatting about what Lord Faulkner's role would be, which was only then envisaged as a kind of caretaker role. Yes. Uh, so and, it was a quite and a And Harry shock. Wolf saying to him, well, that means you won't be head of the judiciary, Charlie. You realise that? And I wasn't sure there was entire agreement about that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, it was a moment of high drama. A moment of high drama. And was it a moment also of of uh, uh, anger or, or worry or, or, I mean, what were the judges? I, was, it might, I mean, it was shell shock. It was much too early at that moment to work out all the implications. Yes. I, mean, I, um, I had been in favour of a, a, a Supreme Court um, as a matter of theory, but it had never been government policy. No, that was one aspect. Yes. But of course, the getting rid of the Lord Chancellor, which was never managed completely in, in any no. case, the, on the face of it, that must have seemed a bit of a shock. Yes, well, that was a shock. Yes, yes. Uh, and um, as you say, it changed the world. But role. again, yes, it, it, the implications hadn't been fully considered. No. And then years elapsed while there were negotiations which Harry Wolfe was leading as Lord Chief Justice um, as to what the changes would involve, and particularly the role of the Lord Chancellor, which was going to be preserved. Mm. That's what, how it evolved, Yes, and the it? independence of the Supreme Court. And I think he did quite a good job, didn't he, in, in negotiating to protect the judge's position. Yes, yes. And if you look at the Act, it envisages that the Lord Chancellor would have, a, a, you know, legal qualifications um, and so be in a position to appreciate the importance of the rule of law. They haven't, the holders haven't the holders, had legal qualifications. I, I, I don't think course. anyone would have envisaged at the time the 
act ah. went through, that there would be people appointed to that, what we saw as a really important government position, yes. who didn't have the kind of experience that would, well, it's, it's changed. we believed, was necessary as a qualification. The role has changed a lot, yes. and perhaps we'll talk about that a little bit further. One of the big things you did, and people will remember you for, is this change of robes. Why did you think that we needed a change of robes for the judges? Well, I think personally, I always hated the business of taking off one collar and putting on a wing collar and all of that. But I mean, more fundamentally, high court judges had five different uniforms. Yes. They had uh, criminal and civil in the winter, criminal and civil in the summer, and that dated back to the time when there was no um, heating, so you needed some really warm robes for the winter and change in the summer. And finally, a black gown if you were sitting doing public law. And I thought, have five different working uniforms was simply absurd and also quite expensive. And did you want to get rid of wigs as well for yes. criminal? You did, no, of not course. For, no, I, you I, never I, wanted... I, I, I was, had an entirely open mind. I could see the benefits of a, a degree of disguise in the criminal court because judges and jurors and counsel all mingled together in public transport and so on in this yes. day and age. You don't yes. have judges being conveyed to court in, in grandeur. Um, and, and also for a very young barrister, it gives a certain gravitas. And at that time, of course, it's not just barristers, but solicitors have got the right to wear wigs. There was a bit of controversy about it, wasn't there? I mean, I think some people didn't like the fact that the new robes looked a little bit European. Uh, there was a considerable majority in favour of change. There was no majority in favour of what particular new uniform we should have. <laughs> and so I, we, it was actually designed by a... A, a, a leading designer, wasn't leading it? leading designer. Uh, with hindsight, I'm not sure that the, the best job was done. I think the, the current uniform would look better with a, a cummerbund. You yes. could have had a cummerbund in a different colour reflecting the, the uh, grade of judge. So really you were a moderniser in that role, weren't you? Oh, in that role, certainly, yes. <laughs> and generally perhaps as all chief justice. But before we go on a bit more about that and get on to sentencing, can I ask you how you came into the law? And did you, you didn't have a lawyer in the family. Your father wasn't a lawyer, your my, mother wasn't. My grandfather was called to the bar by Gray's Inn. He never practised as a barrister, but he practised in the court service and um, ended up as what was rather brutally called in those days, a master in lunacy, <laughs> um, which would now be a, an official in the court of, court of protection. Anyway, <laughs> so I inherited his wig. Oh, right. Um, and he was very pleased. Did you wear it? Yes, I did, and I handed it on to a young barrister. Who, oh, how nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what really got me interested in the law was a, a silk called Walter Rayburn, who came down to our school, Brownson, when I was there, aged about 15, to talk to kind of current, current affairs about being a barrister. And he, he inspired you? He inspired me. What was it about it that you fancied? Well, it, it sounded fun. I, um, I can't pretend I went into the law out of kind of altruistic motives to improve society. I went into the law because it seemed to me to be a bit, you know, look, prospects of being a really enjoyable way of life. When you went in at that stage, obviously after university, because you, you went to Bryanston and then it was university, but not before you'd done national service. Tell me about that. That's right. Well, I had a friend at school whose father was a naval officer. And so he said he was going to try and do national service in the Navy. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do the same. Um, and it was quite difficult to get into the Navy, whereas uh, the Army the, was largely of conscripts, national servicemen. The Navy was largely a pro professional service with very few national servicemen. Anyway, I got taken on in the Navy. I served on the lower deck for a year and then a year as an officer. Um, and, and you why, enjoyed it, did you? I enjoyed it enormously. Most of the time I was out patrolling Cyprus in little minesweepers. <laughs> anyway, when I went up to Cambridge, I read law, and then, I, of course, I had to do a year... Um, for the bar exams and eat, I think it was a 120 dinners or something, an amazing number anyway, uh, where you were supposed to meet barristers and learn about the law. In fact, you met fellow students and it was largely a waste of time in those days. They didn't have any kind of activities for students, which the inns now all have. But one evening I was sitting 
with a couple of barristers who'd been working late and come into dining hall and got talking to them. And one of them, when he heard I'd been in the Navy, said, oh, I practice in Admiralty. Why don't you come and do a pupillage with me? Oh, I see. So that's I how you never, went down that road. I never heard of Admiralty. I had no idea what it was. So I went and kind of looked, looked up what, what's Admiralty law and then also looked up the individual who was Barry Sheen and saw he was appearing in a lot of cases. And you enjoyed it? And so I enjoyed it. Yes, I did. I joined his chambers as a pupil and then I stayed on as a tenant. Did you have ambitions from an early stage to go onto the bench? On the contrary. Or was it just a natural progression? On the contrary, um, I mean, I, I, I think I'm trying to analyse myself, fairly laid back. And I, I didn't follow a career in the law out of as a kind of ambitious path to go up to the next step. I didn't really envisage myself being a QC when I started at the bar, let alone being a judge. Um, and in those days, these not taking silk, that's something you applied for. But yes. going on the bench, you didn't apply. No, you, you were, were tapped on the shoulder. Not tapped on the shoulder, summoned by Lord Helsham. I want you to go on the High Court bench. And, <laughs> and is that what that, happened? At that, yes, exactly what happened to me. And, and at that stage, think? I didn't particularly want to go on the High Court bench. I was having a very enjoyable life as a commercial silk. But I suppose you couldn't say no to Lord Helsham. If you said no to Lord Helsham, you were not invited again. <laughs> so rather reluctantly, I said, all right. So you gave up what would have been quite a lucrative practice, I imagine, at the commercial bar. Well, it's, uh, certainly looking at chambers now, the answer is yes. And it was quite lucrative then. I mean, uh, And how did you find it on the High Court bench? Did you enjoy that? Or did you think this is not really what I like? I, I thought there would be much more camaraderie on the High Court bench than there was. I imagined that judges would wander into each other's rooms in the Royal Courts of Justice for a chat about the case they were trying on. And I was very disappointed to find this didn't happen at all. So it was a bit lonely. It was very, it was very lonely. And, and and in a way, the only thing that alleviated the loneliness was to and fro in court, um, you know, of interchange with members of the bar mostly. Yes. In the court process. Yes, yes. It was when you were in the Court of Appeal, I think, you hadn't been there long, that you were asked to do the BSC inquiry. inquiry. How did That's that right. come about? Who appointed you? Um, well, it was, a, it was a government appointment. Hmm. Somebody must have recommended and you. The, the, the um, Labour government had just taken over and they were very diffident about this inquiry because they were afraid it would look as though it was politically motivated because it was an inquiry into the previous Conservative regime and specifically how the government had handled BSE. It wasn't kind of a scientific inquiry as to where it came from or anything. Yes. And there were suggestions that there had been a cover-up of the possible risk that it would be transmissible to humans because that would be damaging to our agricultural industry and so on and so forth. Did you want to take it on? Um, not particularly. I mean, I, I've never um, rejected, I think, that anything that was new. It's always challenging and it's going to be different. And did it turn out as you imagined? No, it didn't. First of all, my terms of reference were to report within a year, which I'm quite sure they realised was impossible, which it was. And <coughs> the brief was to look at 10 years of government activity involving the whole of the United Kingdom, agricultural ministers, ministers of health, because bovine products are incorporated in medicines. Um, and so I think we had as witnesses at the end of the day, probably 200 ex-ministers. I mean, it was a massive task. The documentation was so heavy that literally they had to survey the building in which the inquiry was being held to make sure that the structure would stand Good the weight yes. of the documents. So very, quite a stressful enterprise. It was very, I mean, I think being under time constraints was the most stressful thing. I had to kind of go crawling back to ask for more time twice. Yes. But also the weight of the inquiry. And the politics behind it, as you alluded to. Did I that not make it stressful? Not the politics, no. I, I don't think there were politics, actually. I think the government was straight in saying they wanted an inquiry into this. Um, just the sheer weight. And also the responsibility that does weigh on you is the reputation of individuals. And in an inquiry, when individuals are um, <coughs> maybe at fault, and their suggestions of fault, 
for the individual concerned, it's an enormously stressful thing. Mm. And they've got to be given a fair hearing. And in the context of an inquiry like that, it's very difficult to give a sufficient time to appraise the conduct of individuals. So you would worry about that when you went to bed at night? I worried. I, what worried me, I'm not quite sure. I think just the general weight of the thing. But it was a period of my life when I was really stressed. I couldn't sleep. I actually went to a hypnotist to try and see if <laughs> he could hypnotise me into sleeping at night without any success. It was very, very stressful. The actual conduct of the inquiry, I enjoyed. I think you said you, you, you almost had, or your family worried, that you might even be on the verge of a nervous yes. breakdown. No, I think I probably was. That, that's a horrific thing. It and, was horrific. and do you think that this is a common experience of judge, four judges handling big inquiries of this nature? Well, I don't know whether they would react as I did, but I have no doubt whatsoever that handling a big inquiry puts enormous stress on you. Do you think the role of the media was an additional uh, I don't, pressure? I don't think so. At the end of the inquiry, I had a press conference. I remember Joshua Rosenberg always asked the first question. He says, how after all this time have you accomplished such an amazing whitewash? Oh, goodness. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, I, it, but, but you presumably are happy with the outcome of it. You didn't think, think it was it, a whitewash. It no, was I a didn't fair think result. it was a whitewash. There was some criticism. Yes. The one thing we criticised strongly was the public pronouncements that there is no evidence that BSE is transmissible to humans. Well, th there wasn't evidence that it wasn't. Um, you know, yeah. but it, it, it gives a kind of false sense of security here, this. You equate it, or the man in the street equates it with meaning um, on scientific appraisal, there's no reason to worry. Yes. Well, it was, it was obviously a very, very stressful experience. Did you ever consider resigning from the inquiry? No, I didn't. Um, I learnt afterwards that Bob Alexander had actually contemplated going to the Lord Chancellor and saying that he ought to stand me down. Gosh. Yeah. Bob Alexander being your good friend at the bar. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because he's doing it as a friend, you mean, because he was so concerned about Just out about of you. friendship, yes. So, I mean, obviously, it was quite apparent to, people to those that who knew you, me that yes. I was under stress. Would you say that that whole experience was probably the worst thing you had to deal with in your time as a judge? Without hesitation, yes, it was. Gosh. I mean, there were aspects of it which were great fun. We engaged about a team of about 50 mostly kind of Australians and New Zealanders having a year off and earning a bit of money. So they'd wander around in bare feet, kind of <laughs> analysing the documents and so on. I used to cycle over there and, and leave my jacket there. And one morning I arrived and realised to my horror that I'd actually taken my jacket away the previous evening and I hadn't got a jacket. So we sat in shirt sleeves that day and everyone thought it was such a good idea. From then on, the, the inquiry sat in shirt sleeves. <laughs> How do you describe yourself as a, a sentencer? Where do you put yourself on the spectrum of the hard and soft sentences? Very, uh, at the extreme end of the soft, um, <laughs> I would say. Um, I always personally attended the Sentencing Guidelines Council, I think it was then called, because I, I felt very strongly about sentencing. When I was Lord Chief Justice, I spent a day um, doing anonymous community service. I remember. Um, yeah, well, I, it was a big... The way I did it was a big mistake, and, and I think my press office were open to criticism because I did it um, with the um, assistance of one particular journalist, for the Observer, and she had a, a, a... I remember. ...a scoop, and all the other newspapers... I, I think, think we had were all furious. ...were furious, we and were. therefore yeah. sort of condemned this as being just... just um, a publicity stunt. Publicity stunt. Yes, and I do if remember I'd, that. If I'd done it without involving anyone and had a press conference afterwards saying, look, I've tried community service and this is what's this involved, is what I felt. it would have had a much better It would effect. indeed, but presumably you were uh, uh, advised about yeah, that. Yeah, I was, yeah. So it and wasn't I, entirely your no, fault, although no. I can remember being annoyed about it myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and did but that I, influence your views? It, it reinforced them. Which were what? That people, custody should be a last, absolute last resort? A, custody should be a last resort. Uh, and B, um, custody should be for as short as possible, really. And it needs to do the purposes for which custody exists. 
which is first of all punishment, secondly deterrence, and thirdly rehabilitation. Now, I believe that there's a limit to uh, the deterrence that the length of sentence imposes. I think if you, are, if you think you may be caught, then you're not going to commit the crime. I think people commit crimes either without thinking about them under stress of emotion or having planned them carefully on the basis they're not going to get caught. Mm. So obviously you need a reasonable length of time in prison for it to be a deterrent sentence. But adding another five years, I don't think it's going to make much difference from the point of view of deterrence. Do, do you think that the judiciary is out of step with the public in, in views about a sentencing? We've, got, we've well, had a run of quite liberal senior judges. Yes. Um, well, you say quite liberal. By comparison to what is the question? I suppose going back 50 years, um, hanging. No, if so you we go, don't have... Oh, we don't have hanging, but that, that was a political matter. Yes. I don't know. I suspect very few High Court judges invo enjoyed sentencing people to death. Do you think that the judges of a previous generation were tougher? Um, not in the length of sentences. But the, the problem with sentencing is that insofar as punishment is concerned, there is no absolute standard. It's a very much a subjective matter, subjective on the part of the sentencer, on the part of the public. But where the public are actually consulted and given a detailed scenario, they tend to be much more lenient than you would expect on sentencing. Yes, and that's if, true. if the public were explained just how much it costs to keep an individual in prison, money that could be used for the health service or education, um, then I think they might have second thoughts about the cry, lock them up for longer. It's a problem though, isn't it? Because sentencing is the most public face of the judiciary. That's where the public, yes. from that, the public form their views of the judiciary. Yes. So does it bring the judiciary into disrepute? I think at the time you were Lord Chief Justice, there was a bit of a tabloid campaign over soft sentencing. You were criticised also by some judges for not standing up for them sufficiently as they saw it. Do you remember that? Um, I may well have been because there was one incident when I was actually abroad on holiday when if I'd been properly switched on, I would have either probably not come back but made some pronouncement from wherever I was in Cyprus That's right. or whatever. That's correct. And if yes. I was criticised about that, I was probably rightly criticised, I think, with hindsight. You know, I, I should have been more astute to react. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, what do you think that looking at sentencing now, it's gone ratcheting up far too much? I mean, do I, we look up too many people? I think we do. And for too long? I think we do. And the, the trouble is, I mean, one's got to have some kind of compromise in life. It is terribly expensive locking people up. And if you were to reduce the length of sentences overall, but spend what you save in improving rehabilitation in prison. Um, you know, a, a system of imprisonment which gives proper resourcing to rehabilitation is very good. A system which doesn't and locks people up like animals in cages for 23 hours out of 24 is basically inhumane. Do we have a, a, a good system? No, I don't think we do. I think we lock people up for far too long. If you read any report on conditions in prison, they're always highly critical. Mm. Mm. And we, just, we don't spend enough on facilities in prisons or indeed in a lot of other places, as we're seeing at the moment. Well. But money you spend locking people up when they're not a danger, when they've been in prison for some years by way of punishment, seems to me is simply wasted expenditure. Mm. We're given a, a tight budget for the public yeah. sector yeah. against health, yes. education, all those yeah. things. Yes. So that's really what we should be doing, you, you would argue. I, I, you argue I would, then and you I would love argue. to, I mean, if I were Prime Minister, I would, and it would be politically unacceptable, query, saying we really need to give an amnesty and sweep out of the prison a lot of old men, and they are men, who are clogging up the prison, living there, um, you know, at, at enormous cost, securing them when they could be living in society quietly at their own expense. You would do that? I, w I would. That would I be think a bold I, step. I think I probably would, yes. I feel quite <laughs> strongly about it. Uh, I'm not a political animal. I think Sunak is doing quite a good job in difficult circumstances. 
But when he produces a, a, a kind of catchphrase, we're going to, after the let me case, life is going to mean life. It's a sound bite. It's, it's complete. Well, if he's going to remove the residual discretion, which keeps us compliant with Strasbourg's view of life not being inevitably life, if he's going to change that simply for electioneering, uh, I think that's lamentable. And it would mean going against the convention, I suppose yes, the it, I mean, logic of it, we'd have to pull out from we, it. We go as far as you possibly could um, in locking people up for life to satisfy the convention. There is a chance with change of circumstances that you would be released, even if you were sentenced to life means life. But it's going to be very rare that it happens. So you're saying, uh, and I, as people know, I'm sure the whole life tariff it, it, in practice, it probably does mean that, but there's always the possibility of review. There always should be. There has, it has to be, yes. under the convention. Yeah. And if, if the government were to end that, judges it, would, would be very dismayed because well, they would lose I, I think, that discussion. I think any thinking person would be dismayed if it meant we broke our ties with Strasbourg because of this. Because Strasbourg feels strongly about it. They you, do. Yeah. And it would probably mean pulling out from the convention. Well, I, it might Logically, well. it do might, you not think? Logically, I think it would. And ministers have floated that. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, um, <laughs> the they? convention isn't always popular with ministers, to put it mildly. No. But you were, you're a supporter of the Human Rights Act and the convention. Yes, I am. But we signed up to the convention, not because we thought what needed to put our own house in order, but in order to support an international it. court that would have an international jurisdiction, um, particularly for other countries where human rights were not as respected as they are in this country. We have, we have had more populist leanings in the last two or three administrations in this country, and there have been mutterings about discarding the convention. Do you think that would be a bad mistake? I think it would be a very bad mistake. And, and again, you say posturings. Um, people in this country don't really, or a lot of people, perhaps understandably, draw a distinction between the European Court of Human Rights <coughs> and the EU. They think it's all part of the EU. It's not. Well, it's yes, I think, do you not think that the whole Brexit um, development has, has uh, sort of fired up people's antipathy to Europe generally and the Convention and the Court, as well as to the EU? Um, stimulated. The yeah, I'm not going to... I, <laughs> this is quite a political question. It the, is. The effect of Brexit in firing up I'm not sure that Brexit has fired up. I think it might have damped down a bit. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just before I, I did want to ask you, and I would like we're yes. leading on quite well to the whole thing of the rule of law and the attitude of ministers. But just on the point about the public and sentencing, if there's always going to be this disparity in view because the public don't understand, which, and they do alter their view, as you've said, surveys yeah. show when they know the circumstances. How can that, that gap be bridged? How can the judiciary not always be seen to oh. be slightly out of step with what people think is right? It's, it's <clears throat> well, first of all, I'm not sure that people think that the judiciary are out of step on sentencing. You get the occasional, what appears to be aberrantly lenient sentence, which of course the media jump on because they, it's a very good copy. But by and large, I don't think the judiciary are criticised for being over lenient on sentencing. Sentencing remarks, which are now broadcast, I think that's a good development because people can then begin to understand what goes into a sentence. But the cases that are being selected tend to be cases where the sentence is going to be heavy. You're not yet getting broadcast. Uh, and of course, who knows in advance what the judge is going to say, but it would be helpful if there was an occasional sentence that was broadcast where the judge gave what might have appeared to be a lenient sentence, explaining why he or she was doing so. It has been a good development, cameras and courts, so. and I think it, it will be extended. Do you, do you not imagine it will I think be? it will be extended. I, I mean, I've be, by and large been in favour of cameras in the courts. In the Supreme Court, we introduced... You did. You, you pioneered it, really, yes, there, didn't did, you? Uh, Cameras yes. were first yeah. in all our courts in the Supreme Court when you were there in charge. Yes. What about the Supreme Court then, since you've mentioned it? I mean, what do you think your achievements were there and what were the challenges of it? The Supreme Court was, in a way, 
all about educating the public in this country and indeed abroad as to the function of our final court of appeal because um, all right in theory the law lords were quite contrary to the separation of powers in practice they worked pretty well as in an independent final court of appeal but try and persuade that to the general public what they were doing or why they were in the house of lords um, almost impossible Possible. and so if you yes. talk to a member of the public about a law lord they'd have not the slightest concept of the reality of the position. So taking them out of Parliament into a Supreme Court, focused attention on them as a court, and the Supreme Court in this country has had much more, I think, attention and publicity uh, in educating the public about... You know, it has cases. made, it made good, yes. very good constitutional sense, didn't I think, it? I think it did, yes. And helped the image of the judiciary along the way. I think so. Were there any, uh, any particular cases that you can single out that you feel made a, uh, quite an impact that you were particularly proud of or glad that the decision was made on your watch? In the Supreme Court, there's an interesting area uh, in relation to Strasbourg. And there was a particular, I mean, there was a lot of antipathy to Strasbourg. There's a risk that we would pull out because Strasbourg would be seen to be interfering with what should really be our domestic concern. And there was one case uh, where a, a man had been convicted on hearsay evidence. And Strasbourg said that, that was contrary to the rights of a fair trial, that you sh a conviction should be mm. largely based upon hearsay evidence. Mm. Um, and that created a, a, a lot of disquiet in this jurisdiction because we have a lot of safeguards, mm. evidentially safeguards. Mm. Um, and so I, I wrote a judgment in a case called Horncastle where we declined to follow Strasbourg and I, it took a lot of writing that particular case, trying to explain to Strasbourg that there are circumstances in which we might decide that Strasbourg hadn't fully appreciated how things work in this country. So that was quite important, uh, asserting well, yourself. It, it, it did actually lead Strasbourg in the next case to say we accept actually we got it wrong as far as this was concerned. And I think they, they did they not subsequently adopt a sort of slightly more hands-off approach? They were yes, more there was, deferential to, to the rulings of our yes, courts. I don't think that was because of Horncastle. I mean, Horncastle had an effect on that area of the law so far as Strasbourg were concerned and, and resulted in Strasbourg adopting an approach which was acceptable. If they had refused to, then I think that might well have led to, you know, real um, pressure Tensions. pulled out of Strasbourg. So we do think the balance now looking at the Supreme Court yes. and Strasbourg is about right in terms of I who think decides what? I think it is. Um, Strasbourg very seldom rules against this country. Um, I, I think we'd probably have the best record at Strasbourg. And we had a similar thing with the whole life tariffs as well. Yes. Where I think yeah. we kept yes. our discretion. Yes, yes. And, and um, I hope we will continue. As you look back and you see how things have changed and I, I mentioned, you know, perhaps we've had a more, more of a populist climate in recent years. Does it worry you, the attitude we've had among ministers to the rule of law under some administrations? I think, yes, it does. Um, the rule of law is something that's not all that easy to, to appreciate. You know, you're academic, you can understand what it is. But it's almost like a religion, the rule of law. It gets into your bones if you practice law and the importance of it. And if you haven't had that experience of it, maybe not even of thinking about it. As some Lord Chancellors now haven't. I'm not going to make any comment about that, some <laughs> Lord <laughs> Chancellors. But, you know, it's not a natural rule uh, that you're kind of ingrained into you at school or university or whatever. You, you need to understand and think about it in order to appreciate just how important it is. There was a... a, a um, Chief Justice of one of the Australian states who used to invite new members of Parliament to come to a little talk he would give about the importance of the rule well, of law. I think that sounds a very good idea. I think it'd be a very good idea because you can't, bl I don't think you can blame people for not appreciating just how important it no. is. But the natural reaction to judges frustrating what you're trying to do 
by way of sen sensible administration, um, you know, can be <laughs> at odds with an appreciation of the importance of the rule of law. Absolutely. I mean, do you think in recent years we've seen from both law officers, politicians, as you say, maybe not through ignorance or whatever other reason, mm. have they had more of a disregard, uh, that, that is a worrying disregard for the rule of law? I think the answer to that is yes. And if you ask why, I think one very powerful reason is that in the old days, the Lord Chancellor would uphold the rule of law. He, he would see it as his job to make sure that his colleagues appreciated the importance of the rule of law. And he would be a man of great standing. The role of Lord Chancellor passed to people of, of high renown who were not looking for any political advancement and who by and large would have the interests of the, the practicing lawyers, the bar in particular, the judges, and the rule of law as priority number one. And we certainly don't have that now. Do you think the Lord Chancellor should be a lawyer? Yes, I do. Although we've had Michael Gove, he was very good. Yes, he wasn't I mean, a lawyer. You, you can't lay down black and white rules, no. but rarely the Lord Chancellor needs, needs to be somebody who has lived in an environment where the rule of law is important. And without that, it's, it's, a, it's a threat, is it? Do you think to our constitution? It's, it's a weakness, I think. Because if you're, if you're Lord Chancellor now and, and you are politically ambitious, um, you know, there's a disincentive to saying to the Prime Minister, hey, Prime Minister, you can't do that. that that's contrary to the rule of law. Which they don't always do. I'm, I'm not privy to what they say to the Lord Chancellor, but I suspect <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Sorry so to, looking the, to, at the, the, to the Prime Minister. That, that's I suspect quite, you're right. Looking at the balance of power then between the, just in conclusion, looking at the balance of power between the executive, the judiciary and the legislature, do you think it's shifted in, in the last 20 years? And do you think the judiciary is in a weaker position perhaps since the changes, the reforms, or not? I think, it, I think it has shifted a bit, or maybe quite a lot. Um, there's always likely to be a tension between the administration and the judiciary, but as far as the running of the courts is concerned, um, I think when we had an old-fashioned Lord Chancellor, the voice of the judges would carry more weight than it does now in issues about resourcing and so on. Do you think judges have had to become more political? I don't think judges are, have become more political, no. But I think maybe they feel more under the domination of the executive than they used to, so far as running their judicial lives are concerned. Looking back at since the reforms took place, do you think the judiciary is in fairly good heart? I mean, it's, it's still a strong voice in the Constitution, despite the um, constraints you've just outlined about budgets and so on, and being slightly more subservient to the executive in that regard. Generally, do you think the three arms work reasonably well, or do you think Parliament has become no, weaker? Or? No, I think they work reasonably well. Um, there is a challenge, I think, to our constitution, which is that running the country technically is so complex now that the idea that you will have laws properly debated in the House of Commons um, is no longer really realistic. Uh, and Henry VIII's clauses are almost inescapable to give government the flexibility it's going to need to run the country. Uh, so that's a, that's a dent in the democratic that, process, well, really. It, it, it's a it, deficit now, it, isn't it, it? It's a real problem, I think, in our system, which assumes that all legislation is going to be carefully considered. And the House of Lords is a vital body in at least making sure that there's a pretty good degree of scrutiny of legislation. But even the House of Lords can't do the whole job. And nobody could. I think there's inevitably got to be more delegation of power. It's given an increased and enhanced role to yeah. retired judges in the House of Lords, hasn't it? It has, it has. But I mean, I think this is a shift in reality of how government runs a country. Um, and it's not obvious what the answer to it is.
This podcast was brought to you by the University of Law. Subscribe now to make sure you don't miss the next episode.